vocabulary. I'm going to begin with a principle of linguistics that I don't think is widely understood in, in the broader world, and that is that language dislikes synonymy. The truth is we don't find that many true synonyms in languages that usually when we do, it's a dialectal difference. So for example, uh, people living in one geographic location may use one word and people in another geographic location may use another word. It's rare though that within a particular speech community, you find true synonyms. In most cases of alleged synonymy, the words do not truly have the same meaning. But to really understand this, we first need to recognize that there are three aspects of meaning and that words can differ in any one of those three aspects. So the three aspects are informational, emotional, and social. The informational aspect, this is what we usually think of in terms of meaning. This is the aspect of a word that contributes to a factual statement. So it helps us to determine whether a statement is true or false. The emotional aspect of language is, I think, less recognized, but it's certainly there. So for example, we can see that there are words whose sole purpose is to express emotion. And I don't mean describe emotion like happy or sad do, which describe emotion in an informational way. I mean words whose purpose is to convey emotion. So for example, ouch, that's its purpose, is to convey that the speaker is in pain. And it really has no truth value to it. Somebody, you don't say ouch and have your friend say to you, false. So this is the, aspect of a word that contributes to the emotional strength of a sentence. It's often described in terms of positive and negative. There's also a social meaning to words. We can also see this, that there are certain words in the language whose only purpose seems to be to facilitate our relations, our social relations between each other, like a word like please has no informational value and no emotional value, but it is important because it establishes the relationship between people. Uh, hi, likewise, as a greeting. You don't say hi to somebody and then have them respond to you, false. Right? It, it just is. <laughs> um, this is the aspect of a word that contributes to the social status of a sentence. So I think a, a good example of this is the level of formality. So whether it is highly formal or highly informal is part of the meaning of a word. We'll begin by looking at the emotional aspect in more detail. Um, I, I wanna focus for the purposes of this talk on the valence, whether it's positive or negative. So for example, we have these pairs like stingy and frugal, where stingy is negative and frugal is positive. But in both cases, it's describing a person who does not spend their money freely. So in terms of its informational value, it means the same thing, but its emotional value means that they are two different words in terms of their meaning. Other pairs like that would be supportive and unctuous. Supportive is positive, unctuous is negative or ambitious, which is positive, and uppity, which is negative. We have to recognize, though, that what I'm talking about is meaning, conventional meaning, part of the semantics of a language, part of our mental grammar. But we should also be aware that there are certain associations that we've got with words uh, that have more to do with our encyclopedic knowledge of the world or associations that we've made. I, an example is that you may have associations with names um, that have nothing to do with the meaning of that name, just that perhaps, uh, I'll give you an example, uh, there was a bully in my elementary school named Mitch. And so I've got really negative feelings about the word Mitch to this day. Other words that we've got that, that are more societal associations would be like uppity, where I don't think there's anything in the linguistic meaning of uppity that is racist, but there is a long history of racists 
using uppity to describe ambitious African Americans. Or the fact that potent, which is similar in a lot of ways to powerful, but a difference is that we have long associated the word potent with sex, um, especially sexual potency. I find this one kind of interesting because uh, some friends and I in college were working our way through Nietzsche. And uh, in the translation we were using, the word potent kept coming up over and over again. So one of my friends went and gave this long analysis about how this was a very male, very sexual description of power. And one of the, my friends said, huh, that's interesting. I wonder what the original word was. And so we kind of scrambled. We found an original version of it, of the book in German, and the word was Macht, which actually has no sexual associations in German. And so suddenly my friend's beautiful analysis of the, uh, uh, you know, sort of male-oriented sexual philosophy of Nietzsche collapsed in on itself. So we have to be aware of the associations that we make with words. And I would argue that perhaps that translator didn't do such a good job in ter terms of choosing potent instead of powerful when translating Macht. Now we're gonna to turn to the social aspect. And I wanna begin with uh, three words that are sometimes confused with each other. There's jargon, slang, and argo. I want to make this clear. The jargon is not the same as slang, is not the same as argo. Jargon, we can define as a language of purpose. In fact, Adams 2009 does define it as a language of purpose. Slang is a language of being, and argo is a language of exclusion. Jargon is used to efficiently accomplish things. Um, any hobby, for example, will have a jargon associated with it. You know, I have talked to skateboarders and they have special terminology because it makes it easier for them to talk about skateboarding. I've talked to knitters and they talk about the special terminology that's useful when talking to other knitters. And of course, any academic field is going to have its own jargon, not to exclude other people, but to make it easier to talk about that field. Slang, on the other hand, tends to have as its purpose a way of signaling who we are socially. It gives us an identity. And I think that's partly, mostly, perhaps why it's so associated with young people. Because I think young people especially are very conscious of their social identity. And so teenagers will indulge in slang quite a bit and, and invent new slang because you constantly have to new, invent new slang to make it hip, to show that you have this identity and not some other identity that's associated with people from a previous generation. And then there's Argo. Like, for example, um, criminal underworlds will develop an Argo as a way of being able to communicate without the authorities being aware. This is a very exclusive approach, intentionally exclusive. I would argue that jargon and slang, although sometimes they're perceived that way, that's not their purpose. They are not meant to exclude, they're meant to include, in the case of slang, and to facilitate conversation in the terms, uh, in, in, in respect to jargon. Another aspect of, of the social aspect of meaning is register. This has to do with the level of formality. Our words index our relationship with our addressee. So it can indicate the level of formality. So when you're writing an academic paper, part of the expectation is that this is a formal paper. And so we should signal that with our words. We will choose more formal words like perform rather than an informal word like do. We can also see that register indicates a situation. So again, right, that certain situations call for certain words, other situations call for other words. So for example, PP is 
highly restricted to conversations that involve children. Urinate tends to be in situations that are rather clinical, like a classroom or a doctor's office. Now we're going to turn to the informational aspect. And the distinction I want to draw here, especially, is with respect to precision versus accuracy. Um, when I took science courses, this was drilled into our head, that precision refers to the degree of refinement, whereas accuracy is a reflection of reality. So let me give you an example. Imagine that you were looking at a table and you wanted to um, know how high that table is. So I could say, well, this table is between two and a half and three and a half feet high. And most any table, that's probably going to be pretty accurate. Like, so imagine a dining room table. That's going to be accurate for just about any dining room table. But it's certainly not precise. On the other hand, if I looked at a dining room table and I said, huh, this table is 34.23 inches high, it's highly unlikely that I am being accurate unless I have very carefully measured it. So there, we're being very precise, but not accurate. It's good to be both, right? We want to be both precise and accurate. But as I was taught in all of my science classes, accuracy trumps precision. Better to be accurate and imprecise than precise and inaccurate.